One of the challenges mainstream television faces is sameness. We've all scrolled through the listings and been presented with an endless array of programming that fits into advertiser-supported shows. Advertisers want to speak to as large an audience as possible. They have a product to sell and they want to place their product next to programming that appeals to that broad audience. And therein lies the problem when it comes to the production of programming that challenges viewers to question their perspectives on big issues. Issues that lie at the heart of our society. Globalization, human rights, equality, freedom of speech, freedom of faith, freedom to choose who you fall in love with, and free market economies. In British Columbia, we're fortunate to have a public broadcaster that operates free of influence, a truly independent voice offering a range of perspectives that challenges viewers to think and debate issues. We invited Rudy Boutinol, Knowledge Network President, to join us for a conversation that matters about the role of independent television in a democracy. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. You are running an independent television station in a world where it's really hard to do. Uh, why is it important that independent television stations survive uh, and play a role in our uh, media landscape? Well, to put a finer point on it, we're a public broadcaster, we're uh, British Columbia's public broadcaster, which means we are owned, in, in fact, by um, you know, British Columbians. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're public broadcasting, and we are independent at arm's length to government and that. And we're there to really um, represent uh, the interest of all British Columbians. Mm -hmm. like that, and, and that means everybody that's in the province, whether they're uh, residents, refugees, uh, visitors, we represent everybody in that province. And you know, in a, in a ever expanding media universe, what's really expanded is commercial space. Yes. That's what's tremendously expanded. And what uh, public space, has stayed the same. And so we become even more important uh, because we're one of the few voices that really represents the, vo you know, um, the entire province's interests. We're not there to sell anything mm -hmm. um, other than ideas, a variety of ideas. Well, is that, are you there to uh, uh, share ideas, to enlighten, to enrich the lives of viewers versus just entertain them? No, now, I, and, and, and I think that there are commercial yeah. broadcasters who go, well, hang on a second, we do that too. Oh. Well, uh, uh, you know, ab absolutely. But at the end of the day, I think a commercial uh, channel's interest is to um, sell advertising. I mean, that's the reality of it. They're, they're there right. to sell the audience to advertisers. Right. And that's why they're very careful about the demographics that they're interested in. They're not interested in the entire audience, they're not interested in 100% of people, they're not interested in old people, they're not interested in very young people. Mm -hmm. They're interested in the core demographic whose brand loyalties have yet to be formed. Yes. That's their interest and that's great. And they use entertainment to do that. We'll use entertainment in the sense to get people engaged into, into important issues or important stories. Mm -hmm. So for us it's just a means to an, to an end and that's to sell ideas, right. not product. Yeah, you remind me, I uh, one time read a very interesting quote from a uh, past CEO of General Motors who had said, a lot of people think we're in the business of making cars. Uh, no, we're in the business of making money. And I think that that might be the difference when we take a look at commercial television. Yeah. They're in the business of being in business. Yeah. Uh, um, and whereas you're in the business of informing. We're in, the, we're in the business of being a public service whose primary uh, mission is to really present uh, um, people with a variety of views of what we think is important for them to consider and the discipline in in public broadcasting is to represent all the views mm -hmm. not the ones that we agree with not the ones that we're comfortable with but what we think are valid um, arguments from a wide spectrum of, of uh, positions because it's for my, you know, I think the mission of all public broadcasters, ours in, specifically, is to re, is to give people uh, the information they need to make up the decision. One to engage them into issues, right, 
and, and, and debate it with their, with their uh, housemates, with their friends, with their colleagues, then uh, do something about it. Whether mm -hmm. it's going out to vote, whether it's signing a petition, whether it's getting engaged in civil society. But our job is to represent, to give them the information they need to make informed decisions. How do you get access to that information though? Because it's not like there is a huge body of work that's being produced here in British Columbia or maybe even in Canada that gives us that, that wide range of voices. You know, people who make documentaries, who put together these programs, also need to go out and find funding and it's not in abundance in, in Canada. No, well, uh, what we do is we represent um, programming from all around the world. Mm -hmm. So we put a lot of our money into a few original BC productions because they're very expensive mm -hmm. to do and they're very difficult to do. And then we uh, pre-commit to a larger body of work, the things that we know that are happening in Canada and around the world. And then we acquire. Um, there are public broadcasters all around the world uh, who produce interesting programming. Uh, so we acquire that programming from all around the world. We curate it. That's our job. Our mm -hmm. job is to go out there and, and find the programs that are happening, uh, that are being made, being produced, and being distributed that we think will be of interest to British Columbians. And that's the job of curation. And there's no shortcut there. You've got to actually go out to these world markets mm -hmm. and find out what's happening. Um, the exception that we have is uh, ver because we're an alternative to everything that's on in, in mainstream Canadian media, we have very, very little pro um, programming from the United States. Ours is an alternative to American programming, so, <laughs> so ours are mostly non-American. So is that because this kind of programming is so rare in the United States? And yet when you take a look at it as a media landscape, I mean, you're overwhelmed. No, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of good things happening in uh, with American documentary in particular. Americans are fantastic at producing uh, documentaries, particularly the independents. It's just that the Canadian system is so overwhelmed by American content right. that really we thought we would um, you know our value proposition, what we give to our audience is alternative views from um, British Columbia, from Canada, from Asia Pacific, from Europe, the Middle East, uh, the Far East. Mm -hmm. So to the, those kind of voices that you won't see in main, most mainstream channels. Mm -hmm. So do you sit down going into each season saying these are the issues that we want to address and, and this is why? Or are you also in a position where you have to say well let's see what's available and based on what is available uh, we'll start to build our programming around that. You know, I'd say it was a mix of both, is that uh, um, I'm very, very well read. I read a lot every day, a uh, wide range of things, and uh, ideas form. So we have this series named Globalization and Discontents. Originally, it started um, years earlier saying, you know, we really need to do something on um, the impact of global trade and the rise of inequality, mm -hmm. how those are linked. And why don't we go look at things on um, the economy? Yep, and, which is pretty broad. And uh, and as we go out to the markets, we start to see, uh, um, you know, we'll 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 see uh, things develop that might fit into that broad idea. I was in Germany doing a workshop, and someone said, "What are you interested in?" I said, "Well, globalization." He said, "Well, we're doing a show on freight. And what's that about? It's about the uh, the real cost of shipping." Mm -hmm. Perfect, an agent of globalization, shipping, you know, uh, one of the old, <laughs> form, oldest forms of globalization. And so, you built the British Empire yeah, and then so, the Spanish Empire and so on. Yeah. So we said, look, we'll commit. We'll commit some money to that to help you get it made. In your, it was a Spanish production uh, out of Amsterdam being pitched in Germany. Uh, and we said, sure, we'll put some money into it. We know who the director is. Mm -hmm. is really a renowned director, does great work, very provocative work. So that's something we know that's coming. Okay, that'll be ready in two years. What, what else do we have? Two years. So did you have any idea how prescient that was going to be, especially when we take a look at the shifts that are happening in Europe and also in the United States, that this whole role of globalization and the way that it's impacting people is far more important than maybe we were willing to, to, to accept or understand going back even two years ago. Yeah, you know, you, you can never say what's going to be the hot topic two years from now. That's absolutely impossible. But you can see what the, the, the things that are coursing through society, the anxieties, mm -hmm. and you see the pattern starting to form. I mean, after the financial, the great rese recession, the financial crash of 2008, all of a sudden people became interested in well, the world economy was on the brink, and then what was the next question? 
what is the world economy? Like, what is an economy? Right. And, well, you and, have that piece about the Fed and its role. That yeah. was, it was riveting. I had yeah. no idea, like, what an important role it played, yeah. not only in the United States, but globally. Well, the, you know, the U.S. Federal Reserve, a lot of people think it's a very abstract thing, has nothing to do with them. Well, it turns out, you know, the U.S. dollar is still the world you know, currency, it's yes. the world reserve currency. It's the mm -hmm. one thing everybody agrees has this specific value. So whatever the U.S. Federal Reserve decides to do, um, raise interest rates, keep them low, yeah. has a huge impact. Who would know that by the federal U.S. Federal Reserve deciding to keep interest rates at historic levels, and guess what? Vancouver house prices have shot through the roof. I wonder if there's a connection. Well, absolutely there's a connection. So those, those are the kind of um, connections that we uh, can see. So we know that there's mm -hmm. something coming down from the BBC Open University on the Fed, US Fed. We've got this thing called Freighton. And then a, one, a British Colombian filmmaker, Charles Wilkinson, comes to us and says, geez, I'd love to do a film on um, why is Vancouver real estate getting out of reach for Vancouverites? Mm -hmm. And so we commissioned him to yes. say, okay, do something specifically on what's happening in Vancouver. That'll be how we'll localize this huge idea of the U.S. Federal Reserve or um, uh, freight and the world you mm -hmm. know, sh uh, cost of shipping. Right. And all these things kind of are happening uh, globally. And these are long-term trends. So we, in the world markets, look for people that are doing projects on such a thing and go, great, that one's finished or nearly finished good. We'll buy it early, mm -hmm. sit on it for uh, six months or a year. Um, the commission is going to take 18 months to do so. And um, we know that's coming, Freighton will be coming, and then we start to put together a closer and closer uh, framework for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we end up with something called globalization discontents. It happens to be the um, Nobel uh, Prize winning writers, the economist uh, Joseph Stieglitz, I've read all his mm -hmm. work. He wrote it shortly after he was the president of the World Bank, finished being president of the World Bank, and really talked about globalization, something that had uh -huh. been happening with the liberalization of the economy under Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Do you get pushback when you uh, put programming like this on the air? Do you get people who say to you, well, hang on a second, like you're coming at this from a perspective that is opposed to the way that we've built our society here. And, and, and what's your response to that? Well, first of all, we, you know, um, we do get pushback uh, occasionally. Um, I'd say as we've developed the, our reputation for these anthologies that we put together that we're getting less of it because mm -hmm. people come to understand it like we're going to present these things. Uh, but we'll also, pre you know, we'll also present the advantages of globalization. Mm -hmm. You know, I happen to be an immigrant to Canada and immigration I think is the great, you know, one of the basics of gl globalization. So I'm glad that, you know, a, a country mm -hmm. like Canada let somebody like me in when I, and my parents in. But um, we present all sorts of points of view, not mm -hmm. just the negative impacts of globalization, but also the, um, the positive aspects. We ran a series earlier, um, many years earlier, called uh, The Commanding Heights. And it was under the first blush of uh, liberalization and had people like Bill Clinton talking about you know, how we've uh, freed the financial markets to be more efficient. And so we ran that series too, and that was a very like pro-globalization, all the great things that came out of it, like cheap goods, you know. <laughs> right. I go to Walmart, you get a, you know, you get a great deal. How do you remain independent? You are, you are um, funded by the provincial government, you both, to a certain extent, yeah. but not entirely. And how do you uh, keep that sort of arm's length relationship that allows you to, to go out and put together programming that you believe has value? Well, um, we, we're a crown corporation, mm -hmm. so we have an established, you know, we're owned by the people of British Columbia and mm -hmm. reporting to the government. Yeah. And that creates a, an arm's length relationship in, in the legislative sense. But we also hold a broadcast license mm -hmm. from the Canadian Regulatory uh, Telecommunications um, Commission, the CRTC, that demands uh, independence. So that's another lever. But we also raise a huge percentage of our operating budgets um, from the public, from about 39,000 British Columbians donate. And these are people that voluntarily donate. Uh, last year they gave us four and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result of being a charitable uh, 
uh, organization, we also have to maintain uh, our independence. So these are the classic um, uh, civil society, uh, social democratic country that Canada is, that, mm -hmm. that there's different centers of, of power that are diffused by partnering up with not we're not just government but we've got a you know we hold a federal um, broadcasting license and we uh, we're registered charity and uh, there's a delicate balance there mm -hmm. um, we do have to report to government on uh, or we come to an agreement on what are the broad topics that we'll cover um, like climate change in the environment indigenous um, perspectives and stories uh, the economy health care uh, providing literate uh, literacy programs for children mm -hmm. so th that's very very broad in the sense that in no way compromises um, what we need to do and then we're free to go out there and do the things that we think are valuable and I think the fact that 39,000 British Columbians mm -hmm. voluntarily donate is a huge vote of, of confidence and gives right. us a lot of you know, um, a lot of leeway to be independent. So if we take a look at the Knowledge Network over the last 15 or 20 years, the size and scope that you were at one time was significantly more than it is today. Like you were doing a lot more production here, you had a, almost a slightly different focus. I, I imagine that the changing media landscape has affected you the same way that it has everybody else. So how do you go about adjusting to that and ensuring that you're still representing the voices of British Columbians and you know, producing uh, works that are here for and about British Columbia? Right, uh, actually we've, um, in, in 11 years we've grown. Um, we were cut back by government a so you, times. you dipped and then yeah. you've, you've been through, coming back, okay. Through our own entre, you know, we run a social enterprise. We own a BBC children's channel that we raise money with. Uh, it's a national subscription channel. We, uh, our donors have really grown, almost doubled in my time in the last 10 years. Uh, we've almost tripled the amount of money that we're raising from charitable donations. We've launched an endowment fund sitting at seven and a half million dollars that'll start spinning wow. interest. Yep. So we've grown that way. But um, the way, in terms of the disruption that's, ch I mean, the internet's changing everything. Mm -hmm. um, we have to adapt to that technology. If you're in this business, you either, you have no choice. You either adapt to the technology or you get out of the business. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that. We are right. available. We, um, we're available on any device. Um, uh, we launch our own apps, we launch, uh, we've got websites, um, we live stream with or without a cable subscription. You can watch us on a computer or on a mobile device. Um, we have video on demand. We, we, right. We're doing all those things. But what I've always said is we're not a technology company, we're a public service company. And you adapt the technologies you have to to stay in the business. Right. But what doesn't change? Human nature doesn't change. Mm -hmm. That never changes. People still have disagreements. People still get hungry. People go to sleep when they're tired. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always said, you know, watch, watch um, human nature. Watch what people are doing, what they're interested in, and communicate to them via stories. That's how people remember things. They remember things by stories. They don't remember things by facts and figures. Mm -hmm. They remember stories, and through stories you convey. And so we're, we're adapting, and we've never been more popular today than ever before. We're regularly top at, we compete with the major networks in primetime television because we're offering people something they can't get elsewhere. Well, and they choose to be subscribers. Like, yeah. not just that they turn on their well, cable, donor. but they, they become donors. They're donors. Yeah. Every, everybody, you don't have to donate, you can get us. And we're available, because of the Broadcasting Act, uh, we're available on every single... Um, uh, cable system, satellite system, um, internet protocol television set that we're must carry and, and we're carried for free. So all these distributors like Shaw and Bell and Rogers and, and TELUS, they love it because they offer their audience something for free. So it gives yeah. us a wide, it, so we're, we reach a million and a half people every week. Just imagine what you could do if all one and a half million said, yeah, I want to donate and support this independent television as well, because I think that that's where we're going. If we want to see yeah. truly independent voices, we need to have viewers and readers support those organizations that they appreciate. You know, that's absolutely right. And it's interesting because um, when I do panels, um, on broadcasting in different parts of the world. Europe and Asia were interesting, where they'd ask, where do you get your money? And we'd tell them we get a, a chunk of it from uh, the, uh, an annual grant from the government, but that we also have people that voluntarily donate. And people would say, well, 
Right, because if they don't donate, they don't get the service. And I'm going, no, no, the service is available to everybody. You have to voluntarily donate. And mm -hmm. I can tell that people were like, there's something, it must be the translation mm -hmm. or something, but because it sounds like people donate to, tel to a television station. Yeah. And finally, a few years ago, I said, we get money from the government and we crowdfund. They go, really? Oh, crowdfunding. Yes, of course. How long have you been doing crowdfunding? And I'm going, well, we've been doing it for 35 years. PBS has been doing it for 50 or 60. Yeah. No, you mean before the internet? And I'm going, yeah, this is the original, you know, civil society where people believe in an idea mm -hmm. and they go, you know what? I'm going to kick in my few bucks every year to support it. And how important is the role that you play in ensuring that we are an informed population and in a democratic society that we're an informed electorate? I think it's really important for my team, the, the programmers there, to have their ear to the ground, to uh, be reading uh, from a variety of sources, listening to people, um, uh, for our filmmakers to live in their community and to listen to what it concerns people and through their artistry mm -hmm. uh, uh, synthesize that to a story that is, is relevant and, and we've got to constantly be on the alert for those stories, on the alert for those stories to make sure that we're commissioning them, that we're presenting them. And what I've said to my programmers, anybody can program things they agree with. And anybody can program things they like. And anybody can pro commission films from filmmakers they like. That doesn't take much discipline. The discipline is to um, program the ideas you disagree with, with the filmmakers you find difficult, and with things you might not even like. Your job is to measure, is it a relevant story that is important for our audience? Is this a well-founded argument? Does it make sense? Is there a logic to it? And if so, to program it. That's constantly what you have to, um, you know, discipline yourself. You have to constantly check your, your own biases to say, yeah, I totally disagree with this point of view, but it's a valid point of view. <laughs> and it's not easy to do. No, no, because sometimes you really, like, really disagree with yeah. them. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Why would I want to give that person a voice? But it's so important that you do. And I, and I really appreciate that you've, number one, figured out how to navigate your way through this tricky media environment that we're in and that you are encouraging independent voices. Thank oh, you for coming in and doing that. It was a pleasure. Thank you that. for having me on. Yeah.